Hi, everybody. So today we are going to talk about rebel music in South Africa. Music inspires community members to undertake individual as well as collective action. And music can really serve as both an expression and a critique of the current culture. So as you guys saw in the movie Amandala, there's a lot of music involved in the anti-apartheid protests that took place in South Africa during the 1980s and 90s. And today's class will really be contextualizing what you guys saw in that movie. So let's get into it. So what I want to start with is just a kind of brief overview of the roughly 300 years of oppression that South Africans face, Black South Africans faced um, under British and uh, Dutch colonialism. So in 1652, the Dutch East India Company began using the Cape of Good Hope as a base for ships traveling between Europe and Asia. The Khoi people who practice extensive forms of pastoral farming and animal husbandry were driven from their lands in a series of frontier wars and were replaced with European settlers, commercial farms, and were converted into slave labor. The British arrive in the Cape of Good Hope about 150 years later, forcing the Dutch to migrate beyond the coast and further into the interior of Africa. Everything begins to change with the discovery of diamonds in 1867, as well as gold in 1886 in South Africa, which really accelerates industrial capitalism in the region, leading to a kind of complete dispossession of independent African chiefdoms of their core territories. As part of this dispossession, Africans also were considered a kind of cheap form of labor that could be used to mine diamonds and gold as part of this new industrial economy. This structure greatly increased the division, economic and social division, between white and black, British and Boer, rich and poor within South Africa. The music that would follow in the next 100 years largely reflects this widening economic and political gap and the struggle to communicate across it. Ethnic, political, and social tensions between English and Dutch settlers, as well as African peoples, resulted in a series of wars and revolts between 1879 and 1915. The first series of wars are called the Confederation Wars, which, set, which were set off in the 1870s and 1880s in response to the British plan to forge a diverse state of Southern Africa into one single controlled federation. So basically the British wanted to create one single monolithic land base out of what had previously been a series of separate kind of smaller African states. There was a lot of resistance by these individual colonies, including the Cape Colony, as well as the various independent Boer republics and independent African states. This led to the Anglo-Zulu War and the first Anglo-Boer War. So Boer is a term that is used to refer to settlers of Dutch and German ethnicity, as well as former employees of the Dutch East Indian Company. So these kind of conflicts over independence were exacerbated by the discovery of diamonds and gold, which led to social upheaval and instability and the rapid expansion of British influence into what's called the Transvaal Territory. This kind of increased competition for these precious resources precipitated the Second Anglo-Boer War between 1899 and 1902. By 1910, the Cape Colony, the Natal Colony, the Transvaal area, and the Orange River Colony were all united as part of a single South African Republic, 
under British control and officiated by a constitutional monarchy. During the early 20th century, the British controlled government enacted a series of laws which were intended to perpetuate white rule and segregation of racial groups. So the central legislative, judicial, and administrative bodies were shared amongst the capitals of white South Africa, ensuring that only white South Africans would be involved in the government. In a report by the South African Native Affairs Commission in 1905, it was decided that no natives could vote in local and national elections. So this was the first kind of official form of legislation in 1905, where African people of African ancestry were denied representation within the British government. In 1913, the Native Land Act was passed, which restricted African land ownership to 7% of the country's total land area, most of which was poor of poor quality and could not meet the needs of the African population. So this is another act that starts to disenfranchise African peoples by taking away lands that were actually good for mining, for farming, for pastoralism, and giving those to settlers. In 1915, the British government introduced what was called pass laws. So these laws required documentation to prove that you were authorized to live in white South Africa. And the introduction of these pass laws effectively regulated the presence of blacks in urban areas. So you had to show your pass as a way to be able to access uh, increasingly segregated areas where white neighborhoods were really separated from black neighborhoods. This kind of segregation was extended under the Native Urban Areas Act of 1923, where Africans were allowed to reside in the cities and townships only to minister to the needs of the white population and had to return each day to rural areas or face imprisonment. So these policies really institutionalized racial segregation and laid the foundation for apartheid as well as for the resistance movements to these extreme forms of oppression. The history of South Africa under white British rule is marked by one of the most brutal systems of racial segregation that the world has ever known. Apartheid legislation, which literally means separateness in Afrikaans, was implemented in 1948. It was produced, this form of legislation was produced by the Afrikaner Nationalist Party, which was a white South African party made up of primarily Boers, people of Dutch, German descent, as well as French descent. This national party was known for what's called their frontier mentality, which was derived from years of brutal discrimination towards Africans and economic deprivation that people Boer people experienced under British rule in the 19th century. Hendrik Verwood was the prime minister of South Africa from 1948 until his assassination in 1966. Verwood is often called the architect of apartheid for his role in the implementation of apartheid during his tenure as Minister of Native Affairs. So many of apartheid policies were merely elaborations on all of these laws that I talked about um, that had established segregation as the status quo in South Africa. However, the sheer brutality of its implementation and its impact on the country signaled a monumental shift. In 1950, the first kind of formal law associated with part, apartheid legislation came into being. So this act is known as the Population Registration Act and classified South Africa into three primary racial groups, white, 
colored, which included people of mixed race or Asian ancestry, and Bantu or native, which included people of African ancestry. And it set aside specific communities for each of these three broad racial categories. In 1951, the Bantu Authorities Act was passed, which created 10 black South African homelands as kind of independent states within British South Africa and stripped millions of citizens uh, of their, their citizenship in South Africa and made them have to carry passports in order to enter white areas. In 1953, the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act was passed, which legalized the separate but not necessarily equal uh, creation of public, sp public spaces for black, colored, and white people in South Africa. So this is similar to the segregation laws uh, that we had here in the United States. Finally, in 1954, the Bantu Resettlement Act was passed. So the Bantu, Bantu Resettlement Act effectively forced millions to migrate from their homes to live in what was called native townships. And the law basically divided South Africa into zones in which members of only one racial group were allowed to live. As was discussed in the movie that you guys watched, one of the largest scale removals as part of the Bantu Removal Act occurred in Sophia Town, which was a community west of Johannesburg, the capital of South Africa, that was kind of like Harlem in the US. It really had a lively arts and politics scene. Uh, it was the kind of center of, of black culture in South Africa. So in 1955, army trucks and armed police descended into Sophia town and forcibly removed 60,000 people from the area. One white observer remarked about this scene, saying it was a fantastic sight in the yard opposite the local bus station. Military lorries were drawn up. Already they were piled high with the pathetic possessions which had come from the row of rooms in the background. A rusty kitchen stove, a few blackened pots and pans, a wicker chair, mattresses belching out their qu their choir stuffing, coil stuffing, sorry, bundles of heaven knows what, and people all soaked to the skin by drenching rain. So this observation really reveals the condescension with which Africans were perceived by whites, as well as the poverty which had already swept through even the most vital black communities in South Africa. Africans perceived the forced removals as a way to really erase black spots in South Africa and make the country look white. Sophia Town was rebuilt as a white su suburb called Triumph, uh, which is the Afrikaans word for triumph, really kind of uh, indicating the colonial uh, mentality that was behind these removals. So the impact of apartheid legislation on the political economy of South Africa is depicted in this chart here. I'll make myself smaller so you guys can see it a little bit better. So as you can see, uh, the amount of land that was allocated between black and whites in South Africa is extremely disproportionate. Whites uh, of various ethnicities owned 87% of all land holdings. Uh, despite having an extreme population difference, 4.5 million uh, whites in South Africa versus 19 million blacks in South Africa. We also see that, that black South Africans had less than 20% uh, of the national income uh, and that they had such a low uh, amount of kind of earnings as well as taxable income because a lot of the work that was being done was wage labor in the household of, households of whites. And not only was there extreme differences in land holdings and income, but there was also differences in basic resources. So the number of doctors per population for black South Africans is one in 44,000 
versus one in 400 for white South Africans. And you can see the infant mortality rate between black and whites was extremely different, 20% and 40% in rural areas versus less than 3% for whites during this time period. So opposition to apartheid evolved from loosely organized unions of nonviolent protesters into political military coalitions led by the African National Congress, or the ANC for short. So the ANC took a more radical approach to resisting apartheid than these smaller nonviolent unions had been doing up until this point. In 1944, members of the ANC, such as Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu, formed the ANC Youth League. And the goal of the Youth League was to develop a kind of forceful popular protest movement against segregation and discrimination. So this is very similar to SNCC here in the, in the United States, led by Dr. Martin Luther King um, in the civil rights movement here. So the youth movement was really critical to both the civil rights movement in the U.S. as well as the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So under the leadership of Alfred Zuma, who really became a kind of key leader in the ANC um, and was born in 1893 and died in 1962, the ANC adopts a method of non-cooperation with the government and begins to link their struggle with the efforts of oppressed people on a more global scale. So Zuma saw no reason to expect change from what he called polite requests. And as such, he really began to mobilize what he saw as a more powerful form of resistance. And under his leadership, the ANC establishes an underground organization that began military training outside of South Africa. So this military wing of the ANC was known as the Spear of the Nation, and they targeted specific places such as police stations and power plants, but avoided, strategically avoided taking any human lives. So in contrast to the FLN, which also had this kind of militarized wing that was targeting strategic assets of the colonial government in, in Algeria. The military wing, the Spear of the Nation, really never uh, chose to undertake the kind of terrorist tactics um, targeting civilians that the FLN did. So in an explanation of the ANC's kind of new policy, which involved this uh, non-cooperation as well as military, strategic military strikes, Nelson Mandela said that we felt that without violence, there would be no way to open up the African people to succeed in their struggle against the principle of white supremacy. All lawful modes of expressing opposition to this principle, the principle of apartheid, had been closed by legislation and were placed in a position in which we had either to accept a permanent state of inferiority or to defy the government. So Nelson Mandela here is really channeling kind of Fanon's logic that the structures of colonialism, because they were so dehumanizing, made violence necessary in order to actually achieve some form of radical change. So it was during this transition to kind of violent resistance that music was often talked about as a weapon of struggle. So as discussed in Amandala, the apartheid era drove its music and its musicians away from home, underground, and apart from fellow musicians. The apartheid state prohibited broadcasting of musicians who went into exile or who sang in opposition to apartheid. And the government destroyed archives of black music, such as African jazz, deeming this sort of music as unworthy uh, of being kind of remembered as part of South African culture. So there was a real deliberate attack on black culture under the apartheid regime, of which music was really at the kind of crucible. The ANC were strong proponents of using culture to mobilize the struggle against apartheid. And this includes music, but also poetry, art, 
theater, and dance. The communal ownership of liberation songs and the adaptability of their message within different movements allowed for them to strengthen, mobilize, and unify African community members. Music does not create political change, of course, as a solitary force, but it is a powerful conduit for change that can stir communities into action. And it expresses and calls attention to oppression and it allows people to kind of bridge cultural, economic, social divides uh, in a way that can unite people under a common cause. So for example, the Bantu Removal Act really sparked the creation of a song called Meadowlands, which was composed in 1958. This song was written in three different languages, three different African languages, and was composed by Strike Villa Kezi, uh, who was a South African vocalist. But what was particularly popularized by Miriam McBella and later by Archie Coker and the Meteors in 1966. So Meadowlands was the township to which so people in Sophia Town were forced to relocate. And the lyrics of this song really express the kind of devastation of this evacuation from Sophia Town. You know, they talk in the in the song. They talk about how we will move all night and day to go stay in Meadowlands. And you will hear the white people saying, let's go to Meadowlands. The international performance of this song by Mbeke and Archie Coker and the Meteors really gave the larger world a window into South Africa and exposed the injustices suffered by Africans who were being forcibly removed from their traditional areas, traditional homelands. So there's not a lot of discussion about the connection between apartheid and hip hop, but one important event is the Artists United Against Apartheid Boycott of Sun City. So in 1985, the protest, this protest was organized by activist Stephen Van Zand and a record producer, Arthur Baker. Uh, to protest apartheid. So Sun City was this resort for uh, very for rich uh, white South Africans um, that was really cut off from the rest of South Africa. And so this, this protest was against this kind of extreme wealth difference, which was really represented by the Sun City Resort. Van Sant was joined by other prominent musicians, including Bob Dylan, Miles Davis and Bobby Womack in their protest. Uh, another kind of protest that we see coming out of the United States against uh, apartheid is by the hip hop artist Ron DMC, who was joined by Melly Mel and Africa Bombada, who protest who released a protest track called Sun City. So other rappers like Cool J. Uh, have released songs that mention Mandela, uh, for example, in their track, uh, Erase Racism. Uh, also, Public Enemy in 1987 releases a track called Time Bomb, which talks specifically about apartheid uh, in South Africa. So in 1990, uh, a single was released called Hip Hop Against Apartheid. Uh, and there's a song there called Free South Africa, which features greats like Queen Latifah, UTFO, Lakeem Shabazz, Jungle Brothers, and X-Clan. So what I'm going to do is play for you guys that song. And I'll make myself small here. 
Uh, just one example of the sorts of protest songs that we see being created uh, during the 1980s and 90s in response to 
apartheid. And these sorts of songs were really a communal act of expression that shed light on the injustices of apartheid and played a major role in the eventual reform of the South African government. So there's obviously much more that could be said about apartheid and the struggle against it. But to kind of wrap up our lecture for today, apartheid finally ended in South Africa after the international community began to put, at, put pressure on the South African government. The U.S. passed a comprehensive anti-apartheid act in 1986, which put in place economic sanctions against South Africa and led to a wave of divestment, which severely hampered the South African economy and really kind of turned the tide of global pressure against apartheid. In 1994, the apartheid regime formally was ousted from power and Nelson Mandela was elected as the first black president of South Africa. So I hope you guys learned something new today about apartheid. Make sure to fill out uh, your reading questions based on the film Amandala, and I'll see you in the next lecture.